What's the worry here, Nick? You've lost some of your talent as an actor? No. Hello and welcome to this week's film show where we have high drama from Nicolas Cage, a road trip in rural Iran and a rummage through Cold War memories in Latvia. But first, news from the French Riviera. As the Cannes Film Festival announces its jury for the 75th edition next month. French actor Vincent Landon will be presiding a collection of jurors who include filmmakers Jeff Nichols, Lajli, Ashka Fahadi, Rebecca Hall and Jasmine Trinker, to name just a few of them. Vincent Landon then, the first French personality to take on the presidential role since Isabelle Huppert in 2009. Lisa Nesselson, film critic, joins us to discuss this and more. Lisa, what do you make of this jury? Well, they're not the kind of names that make general interest media publications swoon, but each of these people, uh, they're all extremely accomplished in their own field, and uh, they will be living together very closely for nine, ten days as they have 21 feature films to assess in the competition competing for the Golden Pal. A nice marathon of film uh, watching to have, I suppose. Now to new releases and a film that's been described as a fictional version of Nicolas Cage being forced to rescue his ex-wife and daughter after becoming involved with the CIA while attending a billionaire's birthday party, in all modesty. This is called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. How's that pitch? Is it accurate? It's spot on, but, but what it leaves out is uh, it doesn't allude to how enjoyable that premise turns out to be. If you like movies, by which I mean filmed entertainment that assumes you have a brain and that you bring it with you when you are selecting a big screen title that sounds like it might be fun. I'm fairly certain you'll get a kick out of this meta confection with plenty of uh, action, sly humor, and really a heart. This movie was in the works long before Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, but it is a wonderful bonus to think that Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky dubbed the voice of Paddington Bear for the Ukrainian release of the two glorious Paddington movies and that Paddington 2 is beautifully incorporated into this twisty and turny and funny Nick Cave extravaganza. I am not that. making that up. You'll back me up on that, won't you? Yes, I am not <laughs> making this up. And overtly incorporating Paddington 2 is really no stranger than anything else that happens in this movie, which hangs together surprisingly well, although it is objectively ridiculous. Uh, Nicolas Cage plays a character named Nicolas Cage and who accepts strictly for the money, to fly from Los Angeles to Mallorca in a private plane to be the paid guest of a wealthy man who's a big fan, a very big fan. But two CIA agents who believe that Cage's host is actually a major international criminal convince Cage to try and get the goods on the wealthy guy. Mm, we've all been there. Well, let's take a look at the unbearable weight of uh, massive talent. I have to say that this is hands down the scariest thing I've ever done in 43 years. This was a, a high wire act. The downside, if I fell, was enormous. But fortunately, I had a great actor in Pedro Pascal, and I had a, a director that was sensitive and understood. We're with Central Intelligence. Do you know who you're spending time with? One of the most ruthless men on the face of this planet. I need you to help the U.S. government. Find a way into that room, Nick. I can see myself doing more of this stuff. I think I might have a real gift for it. Good, because we got another mission for you. No, 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 no. Your friend is working for the U.S. government. Don't lie to me. Are those my golden guns? They're my golden guns. I don't want to kill you. You're the last person I want to kill. I love you. I love you. It's funny. You never know how, it, how a movie comes about, but we thought Nick would somehow pop up back into the zeitgeist. He was too talented to be out of the spotlight for too long, so we just decided to create a situation where he could play a character he's never played before. Well, of course, sometimes movie stars play cameos in films, but it is less common for an entire project to revolve around this premise that an actor we recognised with an established uh, screen persona is playing yet another role <laughs> only under his real name. It's really easy to talk about this. Yes, two previous films pulled this off beautifully. Spike Jones's being John Malkovich, of course, course, and the very meta JCVD, which made wonderful use of Jean-Claude... 
Jean-Claude Van Damme, whose initials those are. Obviously, if Cage hadn't agreed to go along with the idea, the script would have been dead in the water. Uh, it's a movie that sends up movies with incredible affection while keeping us guessing, and I think we should all be very grateful that Cage was game to play this role. Well, he certainly has a sense of humour. Now, to a first film that won Best Film at the London Film Festival. This is a road movie set in rural Iran that's been charming audiences since it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival last July. Tell us a bit more about Panapanahi's Hit the Road. Well, this may be a first film, but it really feels like the work of an experienced veteran filmmaker. Perfectly cast, gorgeous to look at, funny and yet laced with sorrow. This movie puts us in a borrowed car headed somewhere in Iran. Mom is buoyant yet nervous. Dad's leg is in a cast that may or may not be real. Their young son is the definition of rambunctious. The family dog isn't in the best of health, and their adult son is behind the wheel, determined and tense. The mission remains oblique to us for most of the film, but by the end, we are incredibly attached to the characters. Wow, an intriguing mystery then. Let's get a feel for the Iranian vistas and the family dynamics of Hit the Road. So as we said, the director's Pana Panahi there, and some movie fans might recognize that family name. Uh, I hope so. Jafar Panahi, father of Pana Panahi, is one of Iran's most talented and most awarded directors. But he ended up on the wrong side of the Iranian authorities and was forbidden to make movies for 20 years. Since then, he has ingeniously made quite a few movies in the confines of his own apartment, inside cars, taxis. An empty chair with Jafar Panahi's name on it was prominently displayed during the opening Opening ceremonies for the 2010 Cannes Film Festival since Panahi had been invited to be on the jury, but the authorities would not permit him to leave Iran. I don't know if filmmaking talent is hereditary, but uh, moviegoers the world over are very fortunate that father and now son are in this line of work. Certainly continuing his legacy there. Now to an animated documentary that's a co-production between Latvia and Norway. And the director was a girl in Latvia in the 1970s. During the Cold War, she starts out as a fervent young communist, but then gradually questions why the Soviet Union should be uh, dictating everything that happens in her life. Tell us about My Favourite War. Well, you know, if all animated documentaries co-produced by Latvia and Norway are this good, more, please. Uh, My Favorite War is a blend of animation and real film footage. Ilza is living in the self-proclaimed happiest country on earth, but nobody seems to be radiating unfettered bliss. Uh, Ted's conformity is more like it. Nobody can come close to fulfilling their potential without being a member of the Communist Party, of course, and the party may not have you if it was decided somewhere along the way that one of your relatives is an enemy of the state, like Ilza's grandfather. If you're wondering, is I I often do, how entire nations get brainwashed and indoctrinated. This is a bittersweet account through the eyes of a child of how what she was told growing up in Latvia, when it was the westernmost part of the Soviet Union, was deeply flawed and antithetical to basic human aspirations. Mm, fascinating. Well, let's get a glimpse of the distinctive look of My Favourite War. You bent. I got elected as the leader of the whole school unit. Mom, you understand? Mm. Peace is the most important thing in the world. Now, our 
I'll admit it's a strange thing to have, but what is Ilse's favourite war <laughs> from the title? That would be World War II, whose sacrifices were constantly framed as heroic. It's a coincidence, but the film gives one a sense of why it is so effective for Vladimir Putin to say that Russia must get the Nazis out of Ukraine because Soviet indoctrination required a perpetual drumming into all heads at all times that the perfect USSR had defeated the Nazis. Keeping things that direct and simple required a lot of dissimulation and vigorous bending of facts. Ilza is an industrious pioneer scout at just age 10, the youngest leader from her region, but in the mid-1980s, cracks begin to appear in the strictly enforced ideology, almost too neatly mirroring the cracks in the shoddy destruction just about everywhere you look. I had to fight back the tears when I saw footage from August 23, 1989, forming an unbroken human chain, two million people held hands across 600 kilometers, linking the capitals of the Baltic states of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania in a peaceful demonstration called the Baltic Way. Uh, this film has mostly a happy ending, and it's in sweetly accented English, as you saw, so you don't have to be put off or scared of going to see it. Mm. See it. it does sound very pertinent indeed. Now, finally, uh, one for fans of the TV series, uh, Downton Abbey, A New Era, is being released here in France a few days ahead of the UK. I should imagine we can expect more upstairs, downstairs drama this time. Give us the pitch. Uh, well, it's the 1920s and through an inheritance, the very nicely dressed Brits end up spending most of the movie at a lavish property in the south of France. Accordingly, Natalie Bai joins the cast this time along with a number of other French actors. My entire life, I have been in favour of any cinematic or theatrical undertaking that includes Maggie Smith. From Major Babe to Natalie Naturally aging dame, she manages to be a delight to watch, whatever the material. But I'm not sure the British upper classes are what moviegoers are clamoring for at the moment. Mm, I'm not sure they, they make it to the multiplex either. <laughs> Thank you for that roundup this week, Lisa Nesselson. We'll leave you to see for yourselves with a preview of Downton Abbey, A New Era. Remember, you can get more movie news on our website. We're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. It doesn't look good for Papa if she felt the need to keep it a secret. There's trouble in paradise. You don't need me to tell you that marriage is a novel full of plot twists along the way. Women like us fall into two categories, dragons and fools. You must make sure they think of you as a dragon. But with that, I will say good night and leave you to discuss my mysterious past. They're known for their cuisine and saying hello with a kiss. They only work 35 hours per week, when they're not on strike, that is. How true are these clichés about France? Every week, Florence Villeminot tears apart stereotypes. Join us for insight into French culture and current events to understand what makes the French so unique. French Connections, presented by Florence Villemino on France 24 and France24.com.